All right. Who's ready to hear what the word of the Lord says today? Amen. Amen. Let us go to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 17. So if you have your Bibles. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. Let's stand for the reading of the word. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Mighty God, we just thank you today. We just ask that you would just move now among us, open our ears and our hearts to hear and receive your word. In the name of Yeshua, our King, amen. 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 You may be seated. Did you know, the Lord says that we are to be kings and priests. Amen. And this, I think there's some lessons here. I'm going to read, uh, read the account. But Samuel the prophet looked at Saul the king and said, You're little in your eyes, but God has anointed you king of the tribes of Israel. How many know that I think there's many of us that look at ourselves as little? But God has called us and chosen us to be kings and priests in his coming kingdom with him. I'm going to say that again, because if I don't get anything else across for the rest of this message, I believe it's very important to hear this. We see ourselves as one thing. God sees us as something different. We need, we, I pray that the Lord would help all of us begin to see the kings that he's making us to be for his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to chapter 10 and just read the, uh, the account. I'm picking it up. Basically what had happened is Saul was supposed to go into uh, Amalek, the Amalekites, and was supposed to utterly destroy. Someone say utterly. Okay, that means completely. Verse 10. The word of Yahweh came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and he was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Always be careful to set up monuments to yourself, right? <laughs> and then he turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you of Yahweh, I have performed the commandment of Yahweh. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Samuel was like, if you did what God asked you to do, why do I hear these sheep and these oxen? <clears throat> and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what Yahweh said to me this night. And he, Saul, said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord, the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, 
I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on a mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to Yahweh our God, or your God, in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. I know the King James says witchcraft. And presumption, how many know there's a lot of people presuming things about God? <laughs> and presumption is, is as iniquity and idolatry, because it makes our heart our God. The presumption, that's what presumption is. Our mind, our heart. <clears throat> because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And shortly hereafter, they go and they're running along, and Saul reaches out and tears part of Samuel's garment, and Samuel turns heel on him and says, so shall the Lord tear the kingdom from your hand and give it to another. That's the end of the story. The beginning was he was supposed to utterly destroy. Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and everything. Utterly destroy it. And later on, Samuel basically does the king's job for him. He takes a sword and he kills Agag right in front of Saul and says, that's what you're supposed to do, essentially. Now, not in the physical, but how many know that there are things that we are to utterly destroy in our lives? Amen. There are things when we encounter them that are not to be part of the kingdom of God. We're not to keep the best of them and say this is for Yahweh. Amen? We're just to leave them alone. Spiritually destroy them, if you will. And be careful with my words. I don't want you to take this out of context. But you get the idea. When, uh, when the gospel went forth into many nations, the Lord did not want us to pick up all these things and say, oh, well, this is what they do here. We'll destroy that part, but this stuff's good. We'll make this about Jesus. Amen? He wanted us to utterly leave stuff alone. Utterly destroy it, if you will, in the spirit. All right? Does that make sense? Amen. Let us see what the problem with what Saul did was. If we can go to real quick to Exodus. And I'm going somewhere with this. Just three quick points today. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. Just one verse. Exodus 17, 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So this, th there's a problem with this, but I'm going to read Deuteronomy 25 to drive it home and then we'll talk about it. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17 through 19 says much the same thing. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary, talking about the nation of Israel in the wilderness, and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So what had happened? Now you see the sin of Saul. If he'd have read Moses and he'd, he'd known the, this word, he would have known it was his mission as king to obey the voice of God and to utterly remove every memory of Amalek from under the sun. From king to child, yes. This was an, uh, one of the cases where God said utterly destroy everything for what they had done. Amen? So this was the sin, this was the presumption of Saul. He followed his heart. And said, well, surely I can take some of these good-looking sheep and oxen and put them on an altar and make a sacrifice with their oxen and their sheep. God was like, I don't want their sheep. I don't want their oxen. Amen? Presumed. And what he failed was there was a promise God had made to Moses and to Joshua that said, when you go in the land, I want them utterly wiped out from under heaven. And Saul failed 
Samuel finished the job. So there are some things that God wants us to have no part of. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. No, don't go there yet, sorry. Go to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Verse 21, uh, chapter 7, verse 21 through 28. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. And it reads, Thus says the Lord, Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. That's hearkening back to Exodus 19. And walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but they walked in their own counsels, and the stubbornness of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to, um, to them day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Wow. So you shall speak all these words to them, but you will not listen, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. And you shall say to them, This is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God and did not accept discipline. How many know that who the Lord chastens or who the Lord loves, he chastens? Amen. But Israel did not hearken, and the next the rest of this verse is very tragic. It says, Truth has perished, it is cut off from their lips. How many know it is possible for truth to disappear from the people of God and from the house of God? It is. When we fail to listen, when we fail to hearken, it says the nation of Israel, truth was basically lost to them. They lost the ability to hear God, to hear truth, because they didn't hearken. Therefore, they lost the ability to speak truth. It, it perished literally from their mouth. Amen? What we get in Jeremiah, there's so many places I could have gone, there's some in Psalms, etc. The key is this. God, while he instituted a sacrificial system, before he instituted any of that, he really simply wanted obedience. He really just asked for Israel to walk in his ways and to obey. Amen? That is more important than anything. And to bring it into the modern context, all of the ritual we do, right? How many know this is all ritual, really? When it boils down to it. Now we throw our heart into it and it's spirit filled. I get it. But at the end of the day, coming in here, singing some songs, doing communion, preaching the word. If there's no obedience, if, if, yeah, if there's no obedience, it's all, it's like, you can keep all this. Everything we've done so far and communion, you can keep all that if there's no obedience. Everything we do should be part of our walk, but obedience is the key. Amen? And that's basically what Jeremiah says. Isaiah says it in a place, basically he's talking about your new moons and your Sabbaths. What have they done? Because of what they had turned the new moon and the Sabbath into. He's like, man, it's offensive to me because of what you guys are doing. He's like, I grow weary with sin mixed with um, uh, uh, holy days and, and things like that. But Elder, did you have something? Right? Amen. Amen. So I just, that, you know, to me, that was one of the things we learned from this account with Saul. Samuel point blank told him, 
your obedience if you'd have listened to me. Because we find out earlier, God, and through Samuel, had told Saul exactly what he needed to do, and he fell down on the job and didn't do it. And he said, man, if you'd have just obeyed, God didn't even care about these animals you're doing on this altar here. He said, I just wanted you to do the job. <clears throat> the next thing we see is that some things have no place in God's kingdom. And now we get this kind of indirectly from this account. But we see the bigger picture here. There were times, there was reasons why God wanted Israel to utterly destroy certain people from the land. Because he didn't want them to get entangled with their ways by marrying their daughters or their sons and then learning their gods, learning their worship practices and falling into idolatry and false worship. Amen? Some things have no place in God's kingdom. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. This is just a quick... Deuteronomy chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And it reads, These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land. That word careful, think of it like deliberate. You're going you know, to really be conscious of doing this, right? Be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of their, that place. You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. Skip down to verse 8. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. When you combine this with several times in Judges where it says that in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that is exactly where the church unfortunately has been for many, many decades, many centuries even, doing what was right in their own eyes, not according to the word of the Lord. Just as God brought Israel in under Joshua and under uh, some of the other judges and was trying to get them to wipe these nations out and their practices out so that he could establish a holy kingdom, so when the gospel went forth into, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, pagan Rome and pagan wherever else they went, I mean, it was all, you know, people didn't really know how to worship God. They just had stuff. They had come up with things out of the imagination of their minds. I mean, we call it paganism, but really what it was was just false worship. A lot of people that didn't know no better, they were superstitious, they came up with things, came up with religious um, systems, religious worship, uh, different temples and altars and gods, etc., right? And so as the apostles went forth with the word and, and ordained bishops and elders in every city, as they took the world by force, if you will, with the gospel and turned the world upside down. Do you believe that the message for the church was, as you go into the land, adopt what they're doing and make it about Jesus? Or was the mission, go and make disciples of all nations, turning them from their ways to God's ways? Amen? Not saying, well, we'll take a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And we'll just make it about Jesus or Mary or Peter. One example is how many know, how many know like in Rome today, there's an old statue of Zeus that, they, that they've now renamed, I think, Peter. And it's a place where it's worth, this, this particular idol is worshipped so much in Catholicism that they like, I think they go up and they kiss the foot or something of it. And it's like the only thing that's like bright and shiny. Is that, is that right? You, you've been or? Yeah, it's worn away. Like there's no centuries oh you did it ah <laughs> there's centuries on the rest of the statue that they call peter but it's really zeus or jupiter see these statues were made millennia ago and they just keep renaming them. so it might have been jupiter first then it was renamed zeus or vice versa but then they said oh it's peter now so that makes it okay right but no, the same, when we get this mentality that everything that God did with Israel was an example for us, I'm not saying he wants us to go around physically destroying things. Maybe in our house, yeah, that's fine. But I'm saying it's not our job to go to our neighbor's house and say, oh, you need to get rid of this, you need to get rid of that. That's God's job to work on them, right? Okay. But in our lives, there are things that we can destroy. 
And not all of it's a physical thing. Again, some of this is spiritual things. But there are things that, there are things that don't offend God, and there's things that do offend God. And, and here very clearly, God did not want us going into the nations. If he didn't want Israel going to the land and learning the ways of the people that were there, he surely did not want the apostles to take the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ into the rest of the world and just start piling paganism on it and saying it was about Jesus. Amen? Amen. The principle is the same. There's no way you can get around it. He does not want us to worship him after the, the vanity of our own mind or our own heart. This was the presumption of Cain. Cain worshipped God his way. I guarantee you if Cain had been worshipping God the way God had told Adam, Cain, and Abel to worship, Cain would have been fine. But Cain, no, we don't know the details, but something was off with his worship. He was doing something after his own presumption, after the own motivation of his mind, after the imagination of his heart. Amen? And that's, I think, what got him in trouble. So some things just need to be left alone as we move through society, as we move through with the gospel. We need to not take part in certain things. And then if it's in our home, there are certain things that when God brings light to our houses and to our lives, there are things that we, if it's ours, to destroy, then we can destroy it. Amen? Amen. And then also... One last uh, point today. I told you it would not be long. It is incumbent on us to know the word and to trust God and not our heart. Saul was a king. And we can go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 17. Saul was a king, and God had prescribed a remedy, actually not even a remedy, almost like preventative medicine, for Israel, for their kings, whenever he knew it, was, it would be in their heart eventually to have a king like every other nation. And God, in his wisdom, gave them a preventative medicine for kings. How many know that it's a rare thing in any nation to have a king that walks after God? When you have that much power, there's a lot of temptations that can overtake a king. Well, if we are training to be kings and priests and princes in the kingdom of God, these same principles would apply to us. Amen? We are not, we are not children of a God who has rules for everyone else, but then his children can do whatever they want. God does not run the kingdom of God that way, where his kids are above the law. Does that make sense? Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 through 20. It said, so this, is, this would have applied to Saul, and now it applied, many of the, much of this will now apply to us. Amen? As we're preparing to learn how to rule and reign with Christ. Amen? When you come to the land that Yahweh your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom Yahweh your God will choose. So that was first important. They were to, if they were going to have a king, it was important that they prayed and let God choose the king. Okay? One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. How does this apply today? We don't go out and put out uh, a, a job search for pastors and just let someone off the street with any old doctrine come in and be a pastor of the Lord's church. Amen? Amen. That makes sense? That's the application in the Lord's church. Same thing with that first part about choosing king. The same thing. When we're ordaining bishops and elders, there should be Holy Ghost led prayer and, and fasting if necessary to find out who do we ordain bishops, who do we ordain elders, etc. It's the same, it's the same principle, right? And it's not just strangers off the street like, oh, you're a good manager, great, you can come manage the church. This ain't managing anything. It's supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost, baptized, blood bought and washed, amen? One from among your brothers. 
Verse 16, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return to that way again. What does that mean? I believe it means just not relying on the things of this world to prosper the church, right? Not to do it in our flesh through, through the strength of horses or whatever the equivalent today would be. But relying on God, not relying on the might of our strength, the might of horses. <clears throat> Verse 17, And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. We see this when Paul teaches what it means to be like a bishop or an elder in a church. He said, not given to filthy lucre. That's silver and gold. Uh, husband of one wife, etc. And it should be someone that's, that's equally yoked. Amen? Someone that's also a sister in the Lord. If at all possible. Amen? <laughs> Verse 18, and when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of the law either from before the Levitical priest or approved by the Levitical priest. So basically, he's got to get a hold of a real copy of the scriptures. And I would say this is probably referring to the first five books, the books of Moses. And he was supposed to write that. And he was supposed to have his own personal copy of, I would think, the books of Moses. And he was supposed to know this and meditate on this. And this would keep him out of trouble. <clears throat> and it shall be with him and he shall read it or he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. I mean, no, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. By keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up. That's pride, right? So he is to remain humble, not lifted up above his brothers. In the, in the, uh, in the epistles we hear, not lording it over like the Gentiles. So as, as, as kings and priests or kings and uh, princes with, uh, with Yeshua as the head, we're not to lord over like the nations, but we're to humbly prefer our brothers over ourselves. <clears throat> Verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Amen? So what was the point? Point was, the last point was that Saul and, and us, right, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. We're supposed to meditate in the Word. We're supposed to know the Word of God. This is what keeps us able to walk in the law, in the commandments, um, led by the Holy Ghost. Amen? And apparently, at some point, there was a breakdown here with Saul. And because of that, the kingship was removed from him. It was given to David, as we, we know the rest of the story. <clears throat> so the application to the church. As I've you know, talked about again, I want to recap. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Like I said, all this ritual that we do, if the, if the, if the love for God and, and, and a walking in obedience isn't there, then it's kind of just dead. right? It's dead until we get that part right. And that there are some things that when we come in contact with them in this world, there's some things that should be left alone. We don't incorporate them into the worship of God. And then finally is to know the word. If we're studying to reign, we have to know the word. And we have to have the right temperament, the right character. It said he had to be humble, you know, not, you know, he had to, like one of his brethren. He had to be humble with the brethren. Amen. So we have to have the right attitude, the right knowledge of the law, the right character. Amen. And all these are the things that we can learn from uh, this particular uh, incident uh, where Saul was presumptuous. He followed his own heart. He made assumptions. Uh, he did it his way instead of God's way. And he didn't follow through on obedience to what God had told him to do. Amen? Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house today? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. Amen. We can go ahead and stop. And we can open it up to questions.